22 or 23 years old, I said to my girlfriend, we're getting married, we're moving to Los Angeles, I'm gonna be a writer director. She said, what? I said, we're getting married, we're moving to Los Angeles, I'm gonna be a writer director. <laughs> Nothing had prepared her for this. I mean, I'd written some very, very bad plays and produced them, uh, and had no education, uh, you know, barely made it through high school. Uh, and uh, and I, I earned my living in, in, in nefarious ways. And um, so um, we did, we packed up our, my car and we drove and moved. I was illegal there for several, for about five years. I always, I was a very clever writer. I could turn a line, I could turn a scene, but I never looked to see what was troubling me and said what I'd like to write about. And from that moment on, it took a long time, I was mid-30s by that point, it took a long time, but that's what formed me as a writer, just continue to look inside. And as I looked inside, I went, oh, you're one really fucked up individual, aren't you? <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, and, uh, paradoxically, the more fucked up I was, the better the writer I was. And so, and so the really fucked up people in the audience, I think you're gonna make the best writers. <laughs> Thank God for Don Cheadle. Uh, at least he's the first person I went to and he signed on as a producer and, and as an actor and that gave me credibility because people could say, well, I don't know who this Haggis guy is, but if Cheadle trusts him, then and I will too because he's one of those actors that you just, you know, he's, just, he's no fool. He's a really fine actor. So that's the way we eventually convinced a cast to do this very low budget film. And, uh, uh, and then while, while during the shooting that, uh, I was approached by my partner, and I'd been trying to put together Million Dollar Baby for a while, and um, I was gonna direct that, and we had Morgan, and uh, I wanted uh, either Paul Newman or Clint Eastwood uh, for the other role. So I gave it to Clint, and Clint called back to him. A week later said, I love the script, can I direct? <laughs> and I said, no, let him find his own fucking movie. You know, so, <laughs> and then my agents and people descended on me and said, Paul, 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 stop. <laughs> if Clint Eastwood directs your script, it'll make your career. I said, oh, damn, I hate that. I hate that. <laughs> but then I thought, you know, Clint Eastwood is one of my favorite directors of all time. Unforgiven is one of my favorite movies. I went, shit, he'll do a better job than I would. And so I said, yes, of course, I'd, I'd be honored. And thank God I made that decision. Uh, he did a great job, and I had, got to make two of the films with him. Well, sorry for using your bag, Mr. Dunn. You're not going to cry now, are you? No, sir. What I wanted to say by this film was that, um, you know, we don't all win in life. Uh, but what we want is we want our shot. We want our chance. And then if we win or lose, it's not really important. That's why at the end, for me, when she lost, that wasn't what the film was about. The film was about she got her shot. He's, he's trying to protect her and does, he tries to protect her in this whole movie from, from, uh, from going, becoming a champion and, or taking that shot, and that's all she wants. So it's, it's, it's a really unusual love story that way. I believe that you know, films are an emotional medium, so every decision has to be an emotional decision. And so I said, okay, I, want to, I have to use narration. Why? Because I've got a man who doesn't speak largely, you know, in, in Clint Eastwood's character, Frankie. And, uh, okay, so how am I gonna get that out? Okay, well, who's gonna talk? Why are they gonna talk? Because someone should be, they should be talking for a reason. They can't just be sort of voice of God, I think. You know, I think that's, well, sometimes it works, I suppose, but it wouldn't have worked for me. I said, okay, what is the story? All right, and it's, uh, I've got this story, and then I, I thought of what had happened to me in my life and the situations through my divorce, and, and I was estranged, and my daughter and I were estranged. And so Clint's character in this, I, I, I put that in there, this having this estranged daughter. And then in the script, he writes to his daughter every day, and those letters are returned every day, unopened. And I thought, wow, and he does it every day, and he has this big box of them. And so I said, okay, who's writing this? Well, okay, maybe Scrap is writing it. Uh, okay, and why is he doing it? Ah, he's writing a letter. He's writing the last letter after Frankie's gone. He's writing a letter to Frankie's daughter saying, this is who your father was. You'll probably never open this, you'll probably never read it, but if you do, you will know who your father was. I said, ah, that's an emotional reason. Now I have voiceover. And so then I could write the, the narration. Now, I haven't just met you, I wouldn't go as far as calling you a cold heart of bastard. No, of course not. But it wouldn't be a stretch to imagine. You think of women as disposable pleasures rather than meaningful pursuits. So as charming as you are, Mr. Bond, I will be keeping my eye on our government's money and off your perfectly formed hearts. You noticed. 
in this case, I asked myself, okay, ooh, how do you fall in love with somebody? Because I had one scene I figured for them to fall in love, or for them to really to know that these, these, we want these people to be together. I said, oh, okay, what do I like? Okay, what do I like? I like, I love it when someone sees through you, sees through all that armor, and, and, uh, and, and sees right through that crack in your soul and sees who you are and can just nail you for it and can accept it one way or the other. And so I like to, to be seen and to see. And so I said, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. Well, how will I do that? Oh, well, it's a game, isn't it? It's poker, okay? You have to be able to read the person across from you. That's who you play, the person across from you. Well, you have to read them. Okay, so I started off with that, and I just said, so one scene in which he is going, he's, that's what he does. He's a spy, he reads people. And so he's gonna very self-confidently just skewer her. And then she's gonna turn around to the exact same thing to him. I think if you've got a good actor and they can understand the scene, they can act it. So I think my rehearsal process, for the most part, I rehearse lots of different ways, it depends on what the actor needs, is largely just getting them to understand what the scene is. Um, because sometimes it's not apparent on the, on the page, because I don't tend to write all, you know, what the actor's thinking or what they're really doing. And if they say, I hate you, uh, the actor might think he really means I hate you. Well, in fact, he means I love you and I can't live without you. That's what, what I hate you has to mean, I love you and can't live without you. Uh, so, yeah, I know. Uh, but, but that's who we are, because we never, as human beings, say, what we think. We always lie. We lie in every statement we make. Uh, just so we, uh, uh, in one way or another, we have to, you, you, we're always meaning something other than, than what we're saying. And so you have to, just as long as the actor can understand that. I remember with Tommy Lee Jones in, uh, in the Valley of Ella, that was a challenge because I have a great actor in Tommy Lee Jones. Um, and it was, it was a battle to get him. Uh, but uh, I remember sitting down with him and uh, saying, Tommy, how do you, how, what do you, plan to do with this character. And he said, uh, I see him as stupid, and I plan to play him as such. <laughs> and and we, should, we should set up that Tommy is not the most flexible guy in the world. No. He's a man of very strong opinions. And, and I went, wow, I just, I just see my movie just disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, wow, well, here, here's what I think, Tommy. I think that he's not a stupid, I think he's a very smart man, but he's very proud. And so he's blinded by that pride, which so the effect is stupidity. And he went, ah, play him any fucking way you want me to. So, <laughs> so it's great. So I said, great, thank you. And uh, and he did. And so, but it was a great collaboration in the idea. But I had to remind him every day that he was smart. I, I like to start movies with questions, not with answers. Um, and uh, I, had, I had a lot of really disturbing questions. What it was like to live in Los Angeles, and. Um, and, you know, I, I wondered because I was, I felt so isolated there. I'd lived there for a long time. I felt very isolated. And um, you know, there were a number of questions that ran through my head. One was, you know, okay, you are driving in your car. And um, either, and, you know, you cut someone off or you do something. And the person, you know, you don't mean to, but whatever you do, you'll break too hard. Or the person screams past you, you know, flips you the finger and drives off. And, and you go, and all you, all you know about each other at that moment is that you're both assholes. It's the only thing you know. Well, actually, you just know they're an asshole. <laughs> they know you're one. You go right, they turn left. You've already judged this person completely. What happens in the next block when you don't see them anymore? Is there an accident? Do they pull over? Do they save someone's life? You know, or be, do they go home? And because of that, you know, that their, their, their juice is all up, do they get in a fight with their wife? You don't know what happens to them, but, but we are really good at judging people in those moments. So I was, I was curious about that, how quickly we judge people. Problems will always help you. If you, uh, if you get to a scene, and because you have to reverse engineering it, and you know this thing has to occur in it, but it makes no sense, you ask yourself, okay, well, fine. This thing has to occur, and it makes no sense. Okay, a bad writer will just say, well, it, it, no one will notice that it makes no sense, right? It'll be fine. And you see those in the movies, and you go, well, that makes no sense, you know? What, uh, what a, a, a writer should do is say, okay, it makes no sense, now why does it make sense? And, and you come up with the reason why this person has this contradictory feeling or has this thing that she or he has to do uh, to, to make that occur. And then once you have that, you go, ah, and that'll make the scene so much richer. I mean. All the trick, and this is a trick of, of, uh, of when you take a novel and turn it in and adapt it to 
to a screenplay is that, as we know, as writers and as actors and directors in the room, the, uh, is that all character is revealed through action. It's not revealed through dialogue. And so, uh, so you have to make sure the actions of the script and the actions of the scene uh, and, and what the character is doing uh, is, is, is clear enough so that the uh, actor understands what the intent is. But other than that, it's their actions. I mean, I just wrote a scene, I'll give an example of this new movie, where this woman is in love and she's bought a watch for her lover. Swiss watch, Benjamin? <laughs> happens to be a Swiss watch. Is there any people who represent Swiss watches in the company? I could exactly. charge you a lot of money and put it in my phone. Uh, the, uh, but, so she's bought this, we've heard about this. But we also know it's a very contentious relationship. We know that it's a sort of love-hate relationship. And we start to see her really fall in love. They make love, and, it, and as you see, really fall in love. And then we see her come back to her room, her hotel room, and she's obviously smitten. And then she looks at the watch. She takes it out to the gift bags and looks at the watch. And we see her face change, and she takes the watch into the bathroom. She lies it in the sink. She pours water on it, you know, and, and lets it sit there, right? Well, that action of her putting this beautiful watch under water is pretty much going to tell you she's deeply fucking conflicted about this relationship with this guy, right? That she, you know, that there's that there's there's hatred that comes along with the fact that she, you know, doesn't like the fact that she's losing control, that she is in fact, you know, falling in love with whatever. So I had to find an action that would that would do that. So I thought of the watch. Now I don't know if that's going to work out when I shoot it or not, but I don't need to say she looks at it angrily. She puts the watch under water. It pretty much tells you the story. 